Hi, everyone. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Disney Roller Girl. I have a fashion blog that I've had for almost four years. Um, I started my blog just because I work in fashion and I just wanted to have an outlet to share all the things I do in my work. Um, and it was initially anonymous. And I decided a few weeks ago that I was going to go public so that I could do things like this. And um, I didn't know anything about, I didn't really did, was not technologically minded when I started my blog. It was purely to have a sort of online visual diary about what I do. And as time went on, I found that I really understood technology and became almost addicted to all these new progressions that are happening. Um, I've been tweeting for quite a while, and Robin Derrick, who is the creative director of Vogue, tweeted me and asked me if I would like to do this event. So I had a think for a couple of minutes, and I thought, yeah, I'll do it. Um, I think the... I think the interesting about fashion technology is that it's just constantly evolving and moving faster all the time, and you know, it really needs almost a lot of work to keep up with it. Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to just discuss how the role of creative director has changed. We're going to talk about uh, photography, where photography's gone, where it's going, digital photography, fashion and film. Um, brands, fashion brands, and how they engage with bloggers and digital technology. And also, we're going to talk a little bit about the Vogue iPad app. Um, OK, without further ado, oh, there will be questions at the end. If anyone wants to ask any questions at the end, have a think, hold on to them, and we'll have questions and answers at the end as well. So without further ado, um, I'm going to show a film that Robin has made of some of the work that he's done with fashion, and I hope you will enjoy it. And now please wel welcome Robin Derrick. Hello. Oh, that's nice. That's nice to be clapped on. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, so that was a beautiful film, and I actually didn't realise, I think when I think of the creative director of Vogue, I imagine someone that just worked on a magazine and that's all you do, but obviously you've done a lot more than that, and clearly your role as a creative director generally over the years has changed, especially in the last two years. Um, I have seen a... Um, there's been, an, as I say in the film, there's an incredible um, change going on in... Um, so this, is, I mean, this is called fashion and digital this evening. Uh, which is odd, there's sort of two fetish words at the moment that sort of join together, but I mean, there's a massive change going on in all communication, but, but we're here to talk about a specific thing. Um, I, I talked to you or to them, I'm not quite sure, a bit of both. All of us. And um, I graduated from St. Martin's School of Art just over there in 1984. Um, in my first year, we did hot metal. I was the last year to do hot metal type. And then they threw it all away. And then I worked on Apple II magazine, uh, computers before Apple Macs. Um, then through my working career, I've seen digital photography. So 25 years of work, massive change. But that pales into insignificant to the changes that have happened in the last two years. Um, I thought. Well, what we th I thought I'd do is, is sketch the landscape as I kind of see it with fashion brands and, and, and communication, the way it's changing. Um, first of all, a, a, a note about technology. I'm not particularly a sort of technology fan or camera lover or any of those sort of geeky things, but obviously I work with a lot of stuff. Um, You've got three basic changes that have happened. They're not massive changes, like the invention of steam or something, that, that, but they're quite incremental changes that together have fundamentally changed uh, both the fashion industry and the communication industry. One is a, a rather mundane change that's happened in cameras, which, you know, Canon 5 and 7Ds, the still cameras, now shoot very easily high-definition video. The movie cameras, like red cameras, new generation of digital cameras, shoot very easily stills. There's a collision of kit. 
So it makes it very easy to make moving and still images almost simultaneously. And all the kit that goes with that, all the editing suites, is all kind of boiled down onto laptops. So I love all of that because that's democratizing. That in itself wouldn't mean anything, was it not for the fact that you can stream all this video to your phone, your computer, your laptop, and your website. So all this new stuff that's easy to make, everybody can see. Um, and then, of course, you, you have what's happened to the internet, which was changed fundamentally by Facebook from the internet that I saw come in, which was a sort of a series of catalog type websites that sort of showed you things. Um, it, it, it's turned it into communities. So these things have come together and, and, and given people, and in our, for the sake of this discussion, fashion brands, the ability to create media channels and to talk to their audiences. Um, so this is just a landscape. What's more interesting is the new kind of creative you've got to make for this, which I'll come on to. But it, it, this is kind of important. If uh, five years ago, if you were your contact with the brand I work with closely for the last five years, I'm a creative director of Giorgio Armani. Um, five years ago, your contact with Giorgio Armani would have been through a store. That might have been a department store that had a thing. It, it, it might have been through a branded Armani owned store. It might be through an advertising or an editorial or a magazine. So these brands could only talk to you through the filter of these other things. There wasn't a direct communication. Um, what's happened now is two things. They've started to, well, the road to Damascus moment for me was when I was working on the David Beckham underwear campaign with, uh, for Giorgio Armani, which at the time we sort of, uh, I went with my colleague to Los Angeles to shoot. And we sort of took it in our stride. It's a very ordinary kind of shoot, um, celebrities and, and, and fashion. But what happened is, and in fact, it was on the second season where we also worked with his wife, uh, Victoria, that the YouTube film of the behind the scenes, the making of, was seen by more people than the three and a half million dollar billboard campaign. And Fabio Manconi, who's the head of global communication at Giorgio Armani, who is by no means an internet or new media evangelist, said, aha, so if we make the right films, we don't have to buy the billboards anymore. We can actually reach an audience. This it sounds so obvious now. This is only a couple of years ago. And, and at the time, it was, seen, it was quite a sort of novel idea. So basically, we've started to build strategies around that. And what Armani has discovered, like a lot of brands have discovered, who knew? Who knew that people would follow Chloe, Dolce & Gabbana, Armani, uh, as closely as they do. Who knew that the, these brands would inspire not just brand loyalty, but interest, you know, genuine interest in what's going on. Now, so that's the sort of, uh, that's, that's what's happening. The, the, they're sort of creating uh, uh, the goal of every brand, every meeting I sit in, is to have an engaged online community around a brand. Um, it sounds so obvious now, but wasn't a while ago, uh, and, and it's now where they're shifting media spend to. Um, creatively, uh, where are we? So that's kind of what's going on there. What it means is, is that whereby a couple of years ago, a fashion brand would do a fashion show, go and take some pictures, buy some advertising, and basically I would leave, and then come back next six months later, another fashion show, take some pictures, do a campaign and leave. What brands are doing is, is building websites, creating these communities, and then you have a 365 days a year obligation then to make content to show your audience whether you're streaming a fashion show, whether you're filming backstage on a shoot, whether you're, you're, you're doing stuff. You, you, uh, so the list of things, I used to go, I used to spend an absolute fortune every season taking maybe 60 still pictures for Armani and go back and put it on the desk, a desk the size of one of these and just say, that's, thank you very much, that's the campaign, aren't I clever? I've done you a beautiful campaign, Mr. Armani or whoever it was. Nowadays, 
that's not what happened. There's the list of assets I had to make for the Megan Fox film in Los Angeles was two pages of things from a 35-second commercial, a minute and a half director's cut, a making of film, four on set, uh, some billboard pictures on set, some behind-the-scenes stills for press usage, an exclusive interview on set. The range of is assets. That, is, would you Sorry, say that's the same <laughs> across the board for pretty much a lot of in, uh, luxury brands, or would you say Armani are quite ahead of the curve in that? Uh, uh, well, Armani aren't ahead of the curve in many ways, but it, it, the, I think what's... What, what you originally asked, the way the job has changed, is, you know, I've been producing still pictures for 25 years in quite small numbers. And what's interesting now, and what lights me up, is actually there's a new mixture, a new kind of creative stuff that you make, which is, instead of it just being a sort of visual thing, I'm going to make something that looks nice, you have to make this as a creative strategic mix with him. I'm still a creative director, I'm still a jump, I'm an art director, I'm a jumped up graphic designer. But, the, but now what you make to go on a twit pick is different to what you make to go on a YouTube film, which is different to, as I was saying, a billboard and a show. And one starts to learn strategies and new ways to work. For instance, that thing at the end for Reebok, that was commissioned to be shown on the web, which means you would probably shoot it rather low-tech, certainly low-resolution. The truth is it ended up as the largest billboard in the world. And it wasn't the largest print billboard, it was actually a 20-meter-long video screen showing, showing that stuff. Luckily, I shot it on a red one, which was a high-resolution camera. And now I don't shoot on anything else because you know it's going to be repurposed. So if you approach a job, shoot as high definition as you can because you never quite know where it's going to be. It sounds like an obvious strategy, but it's stuff that we're learning. The, the use of the social network stuff. Uh, after we did the, Meg, the, the, the Beckham stuff, working, working with Megan Fox, um, and, and Christian Ronaldo. The, the season before, Armani were very pleased that they got Megan Fox to put that on her Facebook page. And she, she had five million viewers, and it, it, and it just disappeared. You know, they didn't put any links back to Armani, or they didn't drive any traffic. The second season, we contractually put it in Megan Fox's and Christian Ronaldo's contracts that they would put a link back to the Armani channel and we got three million views in two days, and it was the third highest viewed YouTube in the world that week. And it's really exciting to do, to, I think it's really exciting, it, 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 to, to create new visual assets, new things. Some of them are maybe not as, as abstract as you might have made before, like a beautiful still. Some of them are more uh, narrative or more engaging. Uh, it's very difficult to do because a lot of photographers aren't any good at making it moving images. It, it, I haven't got the budget. It, do it's, photographers it's hard. now, you know, good working photographers, is it a given that they now have to make films as well? Or even uh, up and coming photographers, is it, is it a given that they're now going to have to do all this extra stuff? We need a new generation of photographers. They can't do it. They can't do it. They haven't got the uh, 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 training. They haven't got the uh, desire or the time. Because although I now have to produce this massive set of stuff, I don't have any more money. It's not like suddenly I've got to make... Uh, it's the world has changed. The world isn't richer, as we all know. But the world has changed. So luckily, the technology is absorbing some of the costs. Yeah. But but um, it really does take um, uh, the, 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 you know, it's the next generation of photographer that can go still, moving image, grade, they're going to win. And they're probably already thinking like that anyway. When they're thinking about the campaign or whatever, they're thinking, how, do we, how will we do the, the, the... Well, I would hope so. I, 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 I'd, you'd, be, you'd be surprised how many people come to see me with pictures like the ones in the magazine already. And, and, uh, and, and, and I don't think that's the way forward for, for them. I, uh, um, I, I think there's an incredible opportunity now because what I love about all this stuff is ultimately 
so I can't move my head very much with this funny mic, but there's uh, uh, the, uh, ultimately I find all this stuff's quite democratizing. It, it, it's quite easy access. Uh, um, you know, obviously for Armani, they're thrilled that a YouTube channel is free as opposed to a $3 million ad campaign and they can get the views there. But it's also free for you, you know, it's that kind of you can do your own. It's quite open. I don't know whether you'd call it open source, but I'm not a software, but it's, like, it's a very open uh, field. With all the, um, so we were saying about behind the scenes videos, and I know that, um, you know, increasingly all we, we all love to see behind the scenes, and in fact, that's a reason why I think people like you to read me. behind the scenes type blogs, Fashion Insider blogs, which is what mine is, is because people do want to get as far, you know, they're just interested in the industry and they really want to know about it and they just want to know so much. And obviously, the technology has made this possible. And the more it makes it possible, the more people want to know. But with the behind the scenes and also the, the brand engaging with the customers and sort of opening it all up, do we lose any of the magic and the mystique or does that not matter? I, I hate behind the scenes videos on shoots. I, I, it's like it's become a standard thing. You do your fashion shoot and the BTS crew. Uh, BTS, is, sorry. Is the, uh, it's the BTS crew. People, there's people whole careers of BTS crews. <laughs> Uh, and uh, there's good BTS and there's bad BTS. Um, I think, you know, I'm so tired of that shot of the makeup artist going, you know, like, but, but, but there's other ways to do it. You know, I, I, I think, uh, we, I don't know if the Vogue stuff's here, but um, on, on the Vogue app, we, we did a story with Shona Heath who built amazing sets. That was an interesting behind the scenes. She's carrying a big duck or something. You know, there's a kind of there's like something to look at. Giving information and yeah. giving a bit more. I think people are going to tire of generic behind the scenes. It's I mean, I agree. I, I find that quite boring. I know exactly what you mean about those standard the standard shot of all the shoes lined up, and the, it's yeah. all very glamorous. If I, if I I know this would never happen, but if I the behind the scenes that I really want to see is when you're on the shoot and you get the first Polaroid. You don't get Polaroids anymore, don't get but Polaroid. you did. And you'll be like, oh, no, that's terrible. And you have to fix it. And you, you know, a light breaks, and there's always drama. And that, that's the kind of behind the scenes I would like to see. But I know that's never going to happen, because people don't well, really want us uh, to see that. Well, I think, I, I think you know, the fashion and, and it, world, it's an up world. You know, you write about things that you like. Not things that you, nobody says, I hate those trousers, let's feature them in the magazine. It's an up world. It's not a critique of every pair of trousers in the world. Some are good, some are bad. It's, you know, magazines are, it's an up world. It's a positive review. You know, some more positive than others. So, you know, so one is moving the wards. You don't really want to decode it and, and, and pull it apart because that's what we're doing. Um, um, but, you know, I think you do. I don't really want to see sort of fashion show bloopers or that kind of thing. <laughs> but but I think that um, I think there are other. I, I'm more interested in um, in, in uh, and, and, and uh, I know we're going to talk about the Vogue app at the end. But I'm more interested. I think there are other stories to tell and different voices. Um, I think that if you do. You know, a behind the scenes of a shoot is like la 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 la, the makeup and the light and the flash and everything. But if you've got like the makeup artist saying how they did the look, or the set builder telling how they did a thing, you can tell individual creative stories. It's more stories. storytelling, isn't it? I suppose. Well, that's what I was going to say. For kind of brands, what when um, so for for a fashion brand, if I'm creative director, strategic on their uh, on what they're doing. What you, actually, what you actually build for a brand is an editorial calendar. You say, right, you've got two shows a year, so we're going to stream the show, we're going to shoot the campaign, we're going to do behind the scenes on the campaign. It's kind of a given. But actually, we're gonna, you've developed a really crazy zip. So we're going to make a little film about the story of that zip and put that out. And then you've got, uh, you're working with that strange bag company in, in Holland. And, we do a bit of, so there's other stories, not just behind the scenes on fashion shoots, which I really think. But, there's a, but the point that you've, you've hit on, I think, um, it, it, it is one that uh, uh, there's, a, there's a, and this sort of like fashion and moving image, it's all going to be moving now. Well, there's a problem with that, is that when you start to do moving image, you hit the grammar of film. And by film, I mean cinema, movies, blah, blah, blah. Now, first of all, 
you don't necessarily want your fashion film in an hour and 20 minutes movie or even a 30 second commercial. You might want that in 10 second things on a phone or a blah, blah, blah. But also, it's totally acceptable in a fashion magazine to have 10 pictures of a girl walking down the beach in different outfits in every page. If you do that in film, you think the woman is mad because she's walking down the beach just changing clothes. It's sort of because you're expecting, you, you start to see narrative in film. You start to see, so, so you have to find new ways to present. If you're literally trying to present 10 outfits in a film, how do you do that? She gets up in the morning, has a shower, puts something, I mean, if you've got to do that, so, so you can't really use narrative structure. I mean, you can, and then, you end up looking like a Marie Claire story where the girl's having a coffee and a croissant and then inhaling a cab. And uh, it's a very kind of demode way of shooting fashion anyway. So, so you end up, I, I'm quite into, um, at the moment, I'm into sort of the moving still, some of that Nick Knight stuff for the Giorgio Armani campaign. A very locked off, a sort of signature of a fashion film was a locked off camera, you know, and the sort of model doing a sort of a, sort of a moving still. It, 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 it's a, it's a it's a nice uh, 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 convention. And I, 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 on the iPad, the trouble is with the current generation of photographer, if you say, I'd like you to make some moving image, they say, oh, so you want me to direct? <laughs> they say, no. Uh, what, what I would like you to do is to shoot me eight pictures, and four of them I'd like the girl to be moving in. And then I'm going to put that together. And what I built in, in the iPad, which I'll show you a bit of, was a sort of player that was able to show stills and, move, and moving stills. It's like eight pictures at a 250th of a second and then four of them are at three seconds, seven seconds and two seconds or whatever. I think that's much more interesting. Having said that, there are great people that can make great films and, and you know, a, a sort of signature piece, a, uh, I don't know who, a Stephen Meisel film on blah, is maybe great and I'm, Th that's fine too, of course, but, but not everyone can do that. And I, and I think there's a whole new kind of creative to find, which is what I'm struggling with. Yeah, because I mean, do, it's the same as with conventional fashion photography, where it's sometimes it's, you don't, can't really see the clothes. It's all about a mood and it's beautiful and it's great. And then you can have with the fashion films. I don't know if you saw the Chanel Beauty one recently, which was an animation of beauty products. Yeah, yeah. lovely Peter things. Phillips one. And yeah. it's kind of fun. I think that's fun and engaging. And you know, you instantly want to share about it, share it because you're just like, wow. And it's not necessarily about the product. It's not necessarily about we are showing a dress. It's just this is something fun. It represents the brand. Um, it's just something creative we've done, and I think people relate to that. Well, I mean. But that's, that's an example of, um, of a, a content-hungry brand. They need content for their website and stuff, and they're commissioning. I mean, that's a cute little film. I um, don't quite believe Peter did that by himself, but, but, the, but the, it's an animation of, of Chanel Beauty products. I think this might be a good idea to talk about how, how all this relates to Vogue. And I mean, is this a good idea to talk about the app? Well. Yeah, let's just show the, the app film. We can always talk about other things after. I did, I did a sort of promo film for, for the Vogue iPad app. Uh, we'll watch that. We'll watch that. that was, what were you going to ask about the app? <laughs> well, um, I want to know what... Um, apparently, well, you told me that when you came to design the app, the iPad actually hadn't even come out yet. You didn't no. really know. You didn't have the technology there. How does one... How does one... Um, design an app when you haven't actually got the iPad and also how do you decide what to put from the magazine onto an iPad app? I, I, uh, how does one design an app without an iPad? Foolishly is the answer to that. You foolishly did it without. Um, I, I, was, I was all guns blazing and very evangelical and, uh, and, 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 and believed there was uh, you know, a great thing to do here and we were one of the first uh, uh, not the first Vogue app, but the first uh, entire uh, downloadable magazine, which presented problems in itself. But um, no, we developed this, uh, d uh, this app. I, I think that what, what I'm trying to... Do, the, the, the plan is, that, so the way I've outlined brands, the way that, who are essentially the advertisers in Vogue, you know, the, the, the big fashion houses, the, the, the way I've outlined the way they are structuring their communication now by building channels, creating content, 
and, and talking to the thing. A million and a half sign-ups at Armani between Twitter, email, uh, Facebook, whatever. That's a million and a half people you know, do reach straight through. Um, is that I need to do that for Vogue because Vogue is also a brand and uh, it, it, it needs to have that engaged, uh, mythical engaged online community that every brand is, is, is seeking to have. Um, and I think that um, th the problem with having an Armani.com or a Dolce & Gabbana.com or a Versace.com is that you preach to the converted. So the Versace people watch the Versace channel, the Armani people watch the Armani channel, the Dolce & Gabbana people. But actually, if you're Dolce & Gabbana, you actually want to talk to the Armani people because you want to get them. So the sort of plan is that, you know, that, 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 that the Vogue magazine has a broader fashion constituency that is consuming the magazine in, in its different its composite parts, as it were. So, uh, so you, would, you, would, what, you, you have a print iteration, an iPad iteration, a Twitter feed, a site. So, and, and this was sort of the first step towards it, um, for, for me anyway, and, 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 and maybe a false step, but anyway, it's what we did. This, this was, um, so it actually, can, there's a problem with magazines on the iPad, is that currently the ABC circulation um, people, uh, to count as a sale of a magazine, they have to download the whole magazine, or else it doesn't count. Um, so if I could do an app that was a bit of Vogue, but they wouldn't do it, I have to actually download a magazine, uh, which created problems. It gave me an 800 megabyte downloadable app. Problem with that is, uh, it's not necessarily where you would start, but you wonder where the hell the magazine industry has been like, didn't they watch what happened to the music industry? It's like kind of downloading magazines. They, 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 there seems to be a new thing. It seems it's never occurred to them this is going to happen. So, so you're sort of stuck with a magazine in the middle. But what I did is I took the content um, and, and, uh, and, and, and put a, created a, a sort of, I don't know whether it's up there, created a kind of standard looking contents page that had the whole magazine on it. And then I reconfigured all the fashion stories into this player. So this was the five stories. So you could play the print magazine, which I won't show you, because that's very standard iPad fare, runs through the magazine. But then I took each fashion story, and this is one I shot, and, and, and sort of redid it for the pad to use the technology of the pad. So it mixes digital still and moving image. You can go backwards and forwards through it. So it's sort of a reimagining of the fashion story. It's got all the got the instructions that come up there and it's got the text that appears and stuff. So I sort of took, I strong-armed my photographers, uh, Mario Testino, to actually shoot 14 stills, which I then redesigned for the magazine, for the iPad, and got him to shoot video portraits of each one to mix them in, in trying to keep that magazine mixed. I shot a behind the scenes on the show in a Heath shoot. I commissioned a film with a makeup artist telling the story. So I tried to put modern magazine thinking around a downloaded, printed uh, issue. I, I think it'll very much evolve this app, but it was a step towards building that different reimagining of the brand in different ways. And with the advertising that you have on the iPad, Vogue iPad app, you... Do some advertisers then create their own content? Do they create well, some special ads for that? Yes, we, we, we stupidly launched a December issue, which of course is at the end of every brand's advertising spend. So they, 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 it was difficult to get people to recreate new assets for uh, at, at that time. Um, but there were companies, we did six fully, six advertisers that did bespoke new creative and I think about 20 or 30, uh, there's the girl there whose job it is to sell it all next to her. We did 20 or 30 uh, links out that advertisers bought on their pages to link to their site. I mean, I think that what was interesting um, was... The, that, that was bespoke? No, the bespoke, ones, the bespoke ones were um, ones like the Burberry one where you stroke your finger and... Uh, and have anyone seen that? The Burberry ad where you kind of stroke your finger over it and the people move. Uh, a lot of them embedded video and stuff and things. Um, 
it's kind of at a really gimmicky stage, right. fashion on the on 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 the iPad. I mean, this is very much the crystal set of what it's going to be. You know, you you, you uh, this has got a big dent in the back because I hit the programmer with it when it wasn't working, and it's just that it's so difficult to get these platforms to work and be and do what you want to do. And um, but do, you, but do you feel that advertisers, will it get to a stage where advertisers are wanting to create unique content just for the iPad? Well, I, I, I think, that, um, I think what, what advertisers and brands, as I say, have got this community now. Uh, they, you know, they will all have their platforms and their content and that. So what they will do is advertise in the magazines that also have that community. Why, if you've got a million and a half Twitter followers and Facebook fans, why would you take a print ad? Do you know what I mean? You, 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 you're going to create the content for, you're creating new media, you're, you're, you're e-tailing online. I mean, e-tailing was something you wanted to discuss in the future of that with magazines. Yeah, but, we'll you know, you, you're obviously going to do that. You know, you're going to want your magazine to, to embed your film and, and tweet a link to the store opening. And, and that's the way it's all going to go. They're not going to sell print. I mean, you know, Condé Nast is selling print ads and banner ads, but that's going to change. Well, talking about um, this whole sort of brands having conversations and what you just said, just wanting to extend their kind of reach. Um, I mean, with luxury brands, we... I mean, luxury yes, you have, you have the Armanis and Dolce Banners, and they're, they're very sort of... And Mark Jacobs, and a lot, of, a lot of brands are really sort of reaching out. And then you do have the ones, Tom Ford's and the Pradas, that still want to be exclusive and they don't want yeah, to reach out. Do you think it's only a matter of time I, well, before I, they realise they must and they have to? Well, I don't agree that, uh, 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 that anyone is actually pulling out. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, Tom Ford held a very, launched his new collection with a sort of private, non-press, 200 only, not even, very exclusive fashion show in New York. And it was very heralded as someone who's in the face of new media. But it was only because everyone was outside tweeting they couldn't get in that it became kind of a success. It was very clever, don't get me wrong, but it wasn't, it was, everyone knew about it the day it was happening because of the internet and social media. It did didn't he, happen did in spite of it. Did he plan it like that then? Oh, was that part of his strategy? Is that uh, what yeah, you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, a very clever man, Mr. Right. Ford. Yeah. But the, um, um, but I think you, an interesting point you, you touched on uh, is that I have mentioned a lot of luxury brands and, uh, and uh, lots of people struggle with the idea of luxury online and, and notions of, you know, and uh, when you talk about, oh, a lovely spread in Vogue, or well, how can that possibly equate with a YouTube channel or a tweet or whatever. I think there's whole new, uh, there's whole new definitions of what, what constitutes luxury, what constitutes a personal recommendation. If a, uh, when, uh, when Ashley Green from Twilight is sitting in the front of a show and you know, she tweets to her people that this show is amazing, that is an extraordinary, that's a luxury recommendation. That means that you can go further than that. So the use of celebrities is hardly kind of original. But, but that's one kind of recommendation. Peer-to-peer -peer recommendation. L'Oreal, who I also work with, did some research, particularly in skincare uh, for women. Uh, some, I forget the actual statistic, it's like six out of seven or eight out of ten women react to personal recommendations above advertising for skincare. Skincare essentially being a belief product, as opposed to you have to believe it works to buy it, and then you believe that it does. It's very hard to demonstrate, it's a belief. And they would get that belief, they would far rather have a personal recommendation, I mean it's like eight to ten, and then most of those recommendations people are now getting through social networking sites. It's an incredible driver. Um, and uh, I did some work with L'Oreal where we were creating films and makeup tutorials and, and films that were actually on the line, but on, oh, sorry, on where, on, uh, online, but they're not actually for people to look at and sort of browse the web. And no one actually browses any of this stuff, but they all get sent to it by personal recommendation. But it was, it was cached content on the web which we gave Twitter accounts to the counter girls. I found out there was a girl in Texas working on the Armani makeup counter who was stealing makeup and tweeting that she would do wedding looks on people in the local area. I thought this is brilliant. 
Why not? And she was also tweeting to the people that uh, the new mascara is in. It's really great. So she was kind of doing some PR for the company, and she was stealing makeup and charging children fifty dollars for a makeover. I thought, why don't we give every makeup girl a Twitter account and create some kind of online content where somebody fabulous does the makeup and she tweets、uh, the new mascara is here. Look at it online. And this woman who's tweeting knew. All the people that she was tweeting to, you know, and they all lived within 20 miles of the store, you know, and it's sort of, it's that famous advertising last mile, and that was, I think, mean, they didn't do it, L'Oreal, by the way, but this was, this was this was the strategy, so it's still available to do that one. The, the,、uh, but that was an incredible idea that they could kind of, there's a sort of that that, that personal recommendation, and that's a, that's a real, I mean, that's better than a page. In a glossy magazine, that somebody you trust and know tells you this is great, and that's real luxury online. I if think. The, if that's better than a page in a magazine, it's different, but it, it is luxury. The, it brings us to the question. And this is quite a sort of like topical argument at the moment because you have、um, bloggers like me and tweeters and people that you know are well. There are people that are more consumers. I mean, I'm a fashion professional as well, but I am a consumer. And I think there are a lot of bloggers re- that relate to the reason bloggers relate to each other because they're all consumers. They're not really experts, and they relate to each other, and you know believe each other, believe their product review, especially with beauty, but with fashion as well. If that's the case, and they all are quite happy listening to each other's recommendations, then where does that leave the fashion editors and the beauty experts and the journalists that are working on the magazines?、Yeah. Are they then redundant? Well, I, I, I think、um, I, I mean in, in beauty, and as you know, my wife's a beauty blogger as well. And、um, Robin Derrick's wife is a very famous beauty blogger and tweeter, makeup artist. They, they,、um, um, but the I'm embarrassed now. The, <laughs>、uh, the, uh, the, the idea.、Uh, you're absolutely right, and, 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 and it's got very lazy. It's got the, the press and the PR community. I've got really, really lazy. And you know the magazines rerunning press releases of beauty companies, and it's created this massive space for online communities to kind of criticise magazines, review products, and blow this out of the water. I completely agree. The 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 the, the, mute, the beauty journalism in particular, less so fashion, because you've kind of got a vision going on. Some stylist is doing something, but the beauty journalism is a sort of you know. Famous oxymoron, isn't it, beauty journalist? But the 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 the、uh, it's got very very lazy and very complacent, and I think the blogging industry has certainly shown them a thing or two. And so, However, do you think that will change and give them a kick up the bum? The blogging people, it's beauty products we're talking about here. They're not like blogging from the front line. You know, it's like it, 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 they often get very full of themselves about it. The beauty industry. What do you mean? Oh well, you know, how dare they say that lipstick was not available in the U.S.? I bought that last week, and so it's like kind of come on. You know, it's sort of,、uh, and there's a lot of.、Um, also, I having this conversation yesterday with someone. The PR industry. What the hell is the PR industry doing? You would have thought, because there's brands that are now doing their, building their own networks and creating their own thing. <laughs> I hope there、uh, aren't any PRs in the audience. I don't, but it's extraordinary. <laughs> And PRs are taking magazine journalists out to lunch and trying to place their. The PR industry is redundant because brands are going straight over it and talking to their audience, and they're not reacting. It's quite extraordinary. You would have thought for a PR, social media would be like, great, the public is walking through my door, pouring through my screen. I could engage that, take this brand there. But frankly, they're not. It's quite extraordinary. It's it, really quite extraordinary how. And、a lot of the criticism we're talking online on bloggers is actually criti- criticising PR strategies that will launch a product in the states and not in the UK because they can get the cover of WWD yeah, then and then they'll give an exclusive、situation. to L in London. And the journalist at L or whatever will respect that thing. But of course, the beauty bloggers taking it offline in New York and put it out anyway. And then the PR phones up and goes, "That was embargoed for L magazine." It's like kind of, but, do, you, "Do you watch the internet?" It's like, <laughs> Yeah. Okay, that's true. I mean, I suppose from my point of view, I, I I agree with you as well, and I see it happening. And on the one hand, I'm <laughs> I feel for the PRs, the old school PRs, because I'm like, you know, it's, it's a transition, and they're still trying to get their head around it. And then on the other hand, I think, well, no, it's your job to keep、yeah. up. You work in fashion, keep up. 
you know, utilize it, make the most of it. I think the problem is they're not, they're really not engaging in it with, the, with it themselves. They're not on Twitter apart from when they feel like they have to tweet for their brand, but until they engage with it themselves. This is a group of people that are paid to take brands to the public. Yeah. By the way, it's their job to do that, and they're, they're ex it's extraordinary. It's extraordinary. It's industry-wide. Nokia's PR department are the same. It's not just the beauty industry. It's extraordinary. <coughs> they don't get it. Um, E-tailing, you wanted to talk about. Um, I was going to bring up the subject of um, this thing, which I believe we are now calling editorial, which is. Um, I mean, I've noticed it happening more and more, and it's definitely happening now. So you have your. Uh, your editorial sites online, you have your editorial sites and up until now they've been doing editorial and then on the other side you've had your e-tail sites and mostly they sell products. As time's gone on, um, I suppose possibly pioneered by Netaporte, they introduced some editorial content as well, engaging content that makes people keep coming back, not necessarily to shop but just come and check out the content. ASOS do it very well. My wardrobe do it quite well. More and more e-tailers are starting to do editorial. Yeah. And editorial, I don't know if Vogue does this, but some editorial does also you know, do a, a layout of shoes, link to the shoes, but they actually, they're affiliated and they, they get a commission when someone clicks on that link and mm. buys that product. So it's kind of like merging. And I think, I see it going that way, and to me that makes sense. I don't know. I think when we no, talked about it earlier, I, I, I think you would disagree. No, no, no. Because I think that, I mean, you're, you're, you're absolutely right that the, on the e tailers, Netaporte and ASOS, are taking an editorial stance. They're also poaching my staff. My last, my, the creative director of Netaporte used to work for me. My uh, art director under me was headhunted by ASOS. Didn't go oh, la dear. last month. I, it, it's kind of interesting. And Natalie Massonet, who I respect and admire, said to me, Robin, it's great. I just tell them to make it look like Vogue. You know, it, 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 they, they're dressing themselves up as magazines. And, and some of them do it very well, don't get me wrong. Um, but I think that there's a... And, and when I built the, 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 the infamous uh, iPad app here, um, I, I, I was very, very keen that we would somehow engage in that and, 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 and do a sort of e-tailing... Hinting, this is my hinting at the e-tailing future of the magazine, which was this sort of shopping section, um, which actually um, lists all the merchandise that we shoot in the magazine. It looks prettier that way, I think. Um, and that you could kind of do it, and you can... So this is also... And, and my, my vision was that you had a, a click to purchase button at the bottom. I think that debate's over now. I think that... If a magazine features a pair of shoes, if a magazine writes about a play, you want at the bottom to be able to book tickets. If it reviews a book, you want to be able to order it. I think people will expect to shop from anything that's online. Um, I was talking to someone who's developing a very, very, very well-known uh, soap opera that everything is going to be kind of click to buy uh, it, it coming up next season. Everything's going to have a kind of website with everything. Ooh, gossip but, girl. I'm not sure, probably. I don't know. It was a lawyer telling me about it. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't tell me which one it was. But, the, um, but I think everything will be click to buy a boy. You know, you, you, but, but I don't think that's interesting. I think that people would just expect that. That's what we'll have to do. I, f I suspect that Vogue will find that very hard to make money out of and do affiliate deals because our readers will just expect it. ASOS magazine will do it, Netaporte magazine will do it. We'll have to make it easy to shop. We've put the stockist list where you can buy it at the back of the printed magazine for years. But it makes sense that on the digital one you'd be able to go and buy it. Should Vogue make a buck out of that? In my opinion, they'll probably try, but I don't feel that that's the future. People will buy the magazine for its recommendation. And I think the e-tailers will make great shopping. Don't forget, people like to shop. People like going there to Porte to buy. Yeah, you want some color and trends, but I, I think there are, I, I don't think it's going to merge into one super editor advertorial thing. And, and I'm quite keen, as you know, so I'm 17 years at Vogue and quite enamored of, 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 of the brand and its stance and the, and the effort and the team and everything. I think it should stand as an editorial thing. And I think it, you know, it should be a great product that has great coverage, that attends all the shows, that's informed, that people go to for that information. I guess that's what gives it its authority yeah, yeah. as opposed to... 
then diluting and, that. And, and what we sell our advertisers is access to that constituency, not an e-tailing opportunity. Okay, fair enough. Um, well, we've talked, we've talked quite a bit. I was going to ask you, what, what, is, what excites you about you personally about the future of digital? Is there any direction it's going in that you're personally excited about? Um, I, I, if I'm honest, uh, I, 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 I love the change. I love that. I love that I'm not producing stills. And I, 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 like, I like the I like the process. I like the I like the change of persona that this implies. Um, it's been. The production, there's a bit for the last, it happens every, uh, every, I'm not quite sure the timing, every decade and a half. I mean, I was, uh, so I graduated from St. Martin's in 84, I was the art director of The Face, I launched Elle magazine in Italy. So I was, I was, I was, and I was the art director of Glamour magazine in Paris in, in the end of the, end of the 80s. And the sort of rise of the supermodel. We were very, very, and there, was a, and there was a very big sort of star system of photographers, which was sort of Peter Lindbergh, Herberts, and, 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 you know, a sort of vogue has boiled down to sort of six girls and six photographers. And in fact, a lot of the international editors of Vogue came through my office as I'm seen as kind of, I guess, a rather senior figure by now, simply by dint of sitting, sitting there a long time. And they say, so Robin, the, the new editor of Latvian Vogue comes in and says, so Robin said, what, what is a Vogue? You know, and I said, well, you basically there's six top girls and six photographers, and if you get some of that, you're Vogue. And that's got rather tedious again, and it's built back up to, although there's some fantastic talent and great people, don't get me wrong, it's got a little bit stiff. And, and, and I love that this change is going to actually new generation again. I rather hope I can hang on, but I, uh, but, uh, but, uh, the, 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 I think that it does imply new people and, and new movement, and, I, and that that interests me. Great. So um, we ask questions then? I think this is probably a good time to <laughs> put some questions out to the audience. What we've got is we've got people in blue t-shirts two chaps. So with the, who have got are. microphones. So um, put your hand up if you've got a question, but wait for the microphone to get to you. Do you want to choose? Yeah, you, you do it. You're the moderator. Okay, yeah. Hi, I just wanted to ask... Ooh, I can hear um, where you see still photography in, say, five or ten years' time, just straight still photography? I think a colour still picture in five years' time will look like a black and white picture does today. Because no one's going to uninvent it, but it'll be always kind of like a sepia tone. Oh, it's not moving. It will be an option. I can see us doing shoots. Oh, let's shoot some still. You know, it's over. I mean, it's not going to be uninvented, but I don't think for the mainstream media, it will really figure. Honestly. Oh, the chap next to you there, we were... I thought you were doing the choosing. <laughs> hey, um, Hello. you've briefly spoken about um, e-commerce and how e-retailers e are um, using editorial styles and stuff to appeal to people. But um, do you have anything to say about how um, E-retailers e are using other technologies such as video, yeah, social yeah. media, that kind of thing. I, 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 um, I, I, sorry. Because I, I just worked on, um, on a shop uh, that uses moving image to sell the clothes and you can kind of yeah, click on sure. the clothes. And what, one of the things we found was good was that by doing this, people are willing to spend more money on a couture one-off piece because yeah. they can see the way it moves, they can see how heavy the fabric is and stuff like that. So I just wondered if you have anything to say about the where you see e-commerce in five years' time I, relative I to what you've been talking about. I, I think the, um, the kind of, uh, the, 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 the use of new, the retailers are ahead of the brands and the magazines. I think that, uh, I think that a lot of stuff, um, uh, brands are only now getting round to their own e-tailing platform. I mean, I, as I said, some mines in 1984. I came in 1980. This was a flower market until sort of 79. And I remember the Covent Garden General Store and some of the early kind of shows. It was just like a dump here, right? And, and, and look, at, look at retail. I mean, it's still look at this place. I mean, like the temples, you know, the technology, the thought, the planning, the backlit trannies, the video screens. 
the effort that's gone into retail and now e-tail is extraordinary. Um, and and they absolutely have been doing a lot of this stuff for a long time. And, 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 and I've got very good at it. And, 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 and I'm pushing over his head. No, I'm sure you worked on some, some, some very good projects. The, the, the magazines can't afford to do. Um, the brands are only starting to do that. The brands are in a, in a tricky place uh, because uh, if you're a brand, uh, I make uh, this and I sell it to Macy's in New York, uh, Browns in London, and uh, Netta Porte. But actually, don't forget how money I'm only getting. I'm, I'm, if I have my own e-tailing store, I can make more money because I've not got the markup of the, the third party. And in fact, I can undercut everyone that I sell to. Well, of course, they will suddenly stop buying from you. Do you know what I mean? So, so the brands actually themselves, of, of, a lot of people think that the kind of end result of this when I talk about driving traffic is to actually go to an own brand e-tailing store. It isn't. A lot of brands don't want to do their own e-tailing. They've got a great customer base that buys from them. And don't forget, whereas if you're, say, Stella McCartney, who's got her own store and her own e-tailing, and she can use her shop stock as her warehouse for her e-tailing, you can't, if you're, if you don't have your own stores, you will have to do your own buy-in of your own product to run your own e-tailing store. So uh, I was discussing this with quite a well-known designer, and he can't afford to do his own e-tailing store because he would need the cash flow up front to do a buy as if he was a selfridges. So e-tailing is often not, I, I totally agree with you, the retailers have been pushing ahead with it. And the brands are doing more of it themselves. But, but the brands will be creating the traffic, pushing it around to their own e-tailing stores, doing deals. Also maybe creating an exclusive thing which is only available on that brand's e-tailing store. And another piece is exclusive. For them. I mean, it's a minefield for them to actually put the commerce in behind all of this. And I totally agree with you, the retailers ahead of the game. But that technology will, 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 will pass into sort of mainstream media. But some, and I won't take another question, but, but some of that technology is it's quite gimmicky as well, and I think a lot of the, not necessarily the retailers, but some of the, the 3D and all that stuff. I seriously was involved in a project for GQ where you had a picture of the girl on the iPad, and then you turned it upside down and her clothes fell off, like, the, like on the old fountain pen. I mean, and it's such a kind of gimmicky use of technology, and I think some of the things that you see, these so-called interactive campaigns, are really, really gimmicky. But you're right I about I think because retail. we're still Sorry, in a transitional up. stage, I don't mind that so much, because I think, well, Everyone's still just experimenting and trying stuff out. It's when people, like, when people slag off an iPad app, a magazine iPad app, and they're like, oh, they haven't done this and they haven't done that. I think, well, give them a chance. It's still early days, and people are just trying stuff out. So the gimmicky stuff, I'm, I don't mind it, really. We like a bit of gimmicky stuff. <laughs> Could we got some here? Um, lady with a microphone in her hand. Hello, I'd like to ask Navaz a question. Um, Navaz, after four years of being anonymous, you unveiled yourself this week, Lee this week. Um, what is it like coming out? <laughs> um, yes, I had an anonymous blog for four years and I decided to come out because I just um, felt that there were a lot of, basically when you start a blog you don't think, oh I'm going to get lots of followers and um, going to have people waiting for my content every day or anything like that. You just think, I'm going to do a blog for myself and I can ramble on and say what I want. As time goes on and you get people reading you, you get, it, it slightly changes. And obviously, you get people contacting you and opportunities come up. And not even that, but blogging has changed in four years anyway. You know, we didn't have idea. I wasn't on Twitter four years ago. I don't even know if it existed. But it's, it's moved on so much. And there's things I wanted to do with it. I wanted to redesign the blog and um, just make it do more things. I actually think a blog is like your own publication. It can now become a multimedia empire, if you like, because you can put a YouTube channel on it, you can put shopping on it, you can do all these things. Um, so that's why I wanted to do it. I just thought it's got to a point now. And also, I'd been anonymous for four years, and that kind of the novelty had worn off. So I thought, um, just do it. Redesign the blog, which I have done. It's not ready yet, but then I can just out myself and maybe do some video content. I haven't worked out what yet, but just do other things on it. And, um, yeah, it's quite a relief, actually, being out there and being able to say, yeah, this is me. It, the blog is still the same. I'm still going to be saying the same types of things on it. I'm quite outspoken on the blog. I don't really, um, don't really mince my words, and I'll, I'll carry on doing that because I think people 
That's what people respond to when we talk about people reading reviews and, and uh, responding to other consumers. But you, I think you that's bring, what they you like. bring people. I mean, I started following you. I don't quite remember uh, how, but I think that um, I would say nine out of ten of your tweets are links either to your own blog or to Umber's blog or so. And and there's you know everyone. I don't know how many people use Twitter regularly, but but the fact that you 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 know you you I've I've discovered a lot of things through you. You know. Yeah, I mean, I do like to share information. And in fact, you know, Twitter doesn't get that much um, credit. When people talk about blogging, they're still just talking about, you know, WordPress or Blogger. And Twitter is microblogging, and I, I use it so much. I use it to get my information, and I like to share my information. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what gets you a good Twitter following. And again, with blogging, you know, give people good content, uh, whether it's information or opinion or outfit post or whatever, make it interesting and original and informative, and people like that, and then they share it. Yeah. Content is king, really. Is there another? Uh, we've got two more questions. Uh, gentleman with a hat over here, if the microphone can get to him. Uh, this is a question for Robin. I think it's interesting that you talk about the new generation of talent and specifically talking about your work at Giorgio Armani. And you mentioned earlier... That Speaking of new generations yeah, of talent. No. There's a, there's a, and you mentioned this sort of the, the democratisation of access, which I actually think is a misconception. If you look at something like the film that you did with Ronaldo, which was shot by an established director, Johan Rank, who yeah. works with the guy who's from Lady yeah, Gaga. I agree. So the problem that we have as sort of, say, content creators is how do we convince brands like Giorgio Armani to transpose the money that they're using for certain areas of their advertising campaign and put that into film? So... It's not just a case of, well, hey, we can shoot something on 7D. You use the Chanel example. If that hadn't been Peter Phillips, would that have gone on now? So how do, we, how do we convince these brands to use their money in a way to foster yeah. this talent rather than taking this ossified model of Tessino shooting Emma Watson behind the scenes and generating actually content that has cultural relevance beyond people who are already interested in Vogue or fashion? Uh, you've hit the nail on the head. Yo you're watching closely. Johan Rank wasn't my first choice. He got the job because he'd done the H&M Karl Lagerfeld thing that Mr. Armani liked. He wasn't who I proposed to shoot that. I actually didn't prefer... I mean, I'm trying to... You're absolutely right. It's so hard uh, to introduce new talent to these things. One of the reasons why it's hard to introduce new talent is that new talent fucks up a bit more than old talent, I have to say. I've wasted quite a bit of money and time and uh, skin on backing some people. But I mean, you know, maybe it's my job to be a bit braver than that. But some of the brands are more cautious with their money and, 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 and keep it. I completely agree with you. Um, and, and, uh, and it is hard um, to, to, sort of, to sort of bring... I mean, I think Mr. Armani is, is a phenomenal figure, actually. But, uh, and I've enjoyed working with him, and I've, uh, I worked directly with him. And, um, but this is a 76-year-old uh, man that, that you're sort of bringing things to. It's quite hard with some of those brands to do stuff. They, they have ways of working, they're not so, but, but on the other hand, so there's somebody, you know, there's, there's her trying to do digital magazines, hitting the ball out of the court, and then there's Armani, well, go and do it. When I say democratizing, it's like, if you want to shoot the Armani campaign, maybe that's not what you should be doing. Maybe you should be doing the, the other stuff. For, I mean, I, I'm agreeing with you, but I'm, the democratization is, is a physical reality. Nobody's sharing out the money yet, you're right, but, um, and the jobs, but they never did. Uh, this is the fashion industry. It's not like uh, we, everyone gets to have a go, you know what I mean? It's, uh, yeah, it's uh, nothing uh, new, uh, really, is it? It's, it's been it's, happening uh, for years. It's, uh, it, it's tough. But I'll tell you who I never met. I never met the kind of genius who never had a break. You know, I met people that kind of, you know, I think uh, uh, that sounds hard, but uh, uh, it, 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 you, you're absolutely right. And, and I'm, in, you know, you're clearly informed and I hold my hand up to saying, you know, you're guilty on some of those things. But I do believe there's more channels to do. I mean, don't forget, I mean, you know, I was involved in like, the launch of ID in the face and how much money that cost. If you buy, if, if InDesign get the pricing right, on, uh, on Woodwing, you can at the end of that process pe press a button and produce an app as good, I mean, technically resolution as that and submit it straight to the Apple Store and it will be approved. You know, it's that kind of, the technology is there to do it and the financial barrier to actually make stuff was much higher. That's the democratization I'm talking about. 
not the clients are suddenly getting informed, creative and munificent. Uh, I think that's all we have time for. Thank you everyone for coming, for Thank listening you and for your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much.